Hello and welcome back to Fellowship of the Golden Age. We're back from a break over Christmas and the New Year and we're going to kick off this year, 2024, with Sandy Singer. Hello, everyone. Yeah. So if you've done um, conferences uh, on webinars or before, you would have heard a woman um, leading the invocations, and Sandy's that woman. That's me. Yeah. And you attend a few conferences, don't you? Like you attend quite a lot of them, right? Yeah, if I can, I will. Good on you. All right, let's dive in. Um, so we'll open up with, um, because this series is focusing on separate selves, um, I'd like it if you could give your description of how you would describe a separate self. Well, since that concept came to me in 2012, you know, that's 11 years now, um, I actually realised that I was aware of it before then, but not in that term as a separate self. We all are familiar with the ego and that we'll say to somebody, oh, that's their ego talking, or, you know, whatever. We have that sense. And I remember my first noticeable distinction as to what that ego really is uh, when I noticed that I read something that said the hallmark of the ego is being offended, feeling offended. And there was a person at work at that time that was really offending me. I felt really offended. And I suddenly realized, that's the ego. And then I reflected, but wait, I'm not that because I know that I'm a spiritual being. I know that I'm on exactly the path and the purpose to disidentify from that. So that was my first sort of breakthrough into a really uh, integrating what, uh, what a piece of the ego was that was acting out in me and even taking over me, even acting as me. And so then later when we got the teachings on the separate self, uh, even the Mahachohan also called them spirits. So there's also selves and spirits. Um, I, it immediately made sense as a, as an extension of this, something that I can see in myself that was even acting as if it was myself and how I was identified with it in that moment. But then after, when you self reflect, you can see that it's out of alignment, something that's out of alignment with your actual core principles for your personal growth, your outlook, your life. Because as a spiritual person, we are positive people. And it's not the kind of positive mental attitude, you know, where you're forcing yourself to just be positive no matter what. We really have a positive uh, perspective on life. And then when we see this negative overlay come out, then I know it's it's obviously a separate self. Um, and I also see separate selves as the contents of the container of the ego. So just say the ego is an outer, a vessel of some kind, like a boat. It's been used in different teachings, metaphor, the ego is a boat. And you, you're you crossing the to the farthest shore, but when you get there, you can't take the boat with you. You, you have to leave behind the boat. And the reason is because the ego's in the boat. <laughs> you know, the ego is like embedded in the fabric of the boat, in the materials of the boat. You really cannot take it with you. So the ego is the container for all the separate selves and spirits and uh, programmed reactions, let's call them habits or, you know, broken records or things where we're stuck and we're going around and repeating them and having the same, um, getting the same results where we're not getting any, having something new. It's the same thing happening over again. All of that it makes it seem very clear at this point in my life, not always, but at this point in my life, that those those kinds of things just expose the separate selves as part of the ego, mm -hmm. and they all have to, to go. Yeah, yeah. And so what we discovered is, like, it is a long 
journey of seeing each single separate self like there's not just like you know ego and then I've overcome the ego like we've got to look at every single identity and and get to the core of it see it and let it go let it die so would you be able to give an example of you know a way of describing you know a particular separate self that you've worked on um well i experience selves as individual some as individual selves but also as groups a group of men male selves a group of female selves or even a family, like a father and a mother and several children. So wow. I have experienced a multitude of types of self. It's really almost never just one. And um, you know, they're, they're, it always seems to be related to a house or a past life where I lived before or, or, or who I knew at the time or who was my family member at the time. And I'm, I'm in my dreams. I'm, I'm going back to places that I lived and um, because there was attachments, because there was unresolved psychology, there was imbalanced relationships, whether it was the father and the mother or with, between siblings or, or if it's my own household, wife and husband, and then our children. Um, so these are all things that come up for me in, in a multitude of ways with um, kind of playing out like little, little dramas. And I know that they're also selves because a lot of times myself and this group of selves or beings were actually in going to the theater. It's so funny, but there's we're actually like walking in the door of a theater or we're going to a theater or we're going to see the movie. And, and this is all the signs that it was in the theater of the mind that, you know, the Plato's uh, um, metaphors about the mind. And so it makes it very easy for me to, oh, I'm going to the movie again. Or, and then with my own dad, my dad and myself and another person, Walking to see a play, you know, walking down the street together to go to see a play. And so I even know that I'm working to resolve things with other people that I'm not really physically in contact with now, but but that are still, we're still part of some part of my life at this time. So for me, it plays out a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, I do see them in groups also, but um, I tend to... Yeah, I just the idea that there's a whole family or a group interacting with one another, like that sort of makes sense. Because I also often find if one comes up, like, you know, then there's a bit of a, um, what's the word, like the wall comes tumbling down, like, you know, there's one after the other and I, I can't sort of look at one without dealing with other ones at the, at the same time. There's a bit of a, yeah, an avalanche. <laughs> Well, and in fact, what ends up having to happen is I have to kick these people out of my house, my temple, my mind, my emotional body, my mental body, my identity body, because their attachments to something unresolved, it's like a discarnate spirit. Like we know about, you know, graveyards being haunted, the people don't let go of their body. There's truly is. These are discarnates. They're discarnate. And they can't remain. So a lot of times I have the experience that of over having to overcome sympathy for them. Like because I created them, I should love them and nurture them and I should keep allow them to stay and I should feed them and take care of them. This is what they expect. And then when they get exposed, they try to pull this game on me. And then I really have to kick them out and be kind of ruthless really is like like people they would be presented to me as the most down on their luck family like a father and mother and ragged children and dirty and all this and, oh we need food and we have nowhere else to go and all these crying things but honestly I, you know you have to say hey, you're out because they're not real. Like they're they're just they're actually not real. They're not living. They have they don't have love in them or anything like that. Like they're they're unrealities. So it's like 
giving reality to, I, I don't know, like a Tamagotchi watch, you know, something that's on a computer screen that doesn't have, you know, an animated thing that doesn't have any inherent life in it. Um, until we recognise that, that these selves are not real, like they're just... Mm. And there was a group of like six men and they all looked like clones, you know, <laughs> they all looked alike, like, like they were literally like clones. And um, like one of them was one of them was the spokesperson, and he was like, "Oh, he was all worried, like this. Oh, I'm gonna die today, and you know." <laughs> and then he did. He fell down on the floor, and they all they all died. But so it's for me. I'm just pointing out that it's not necessarily one at a time. It's things that are similar can go in groups. So yeah. so that you know, hopefully, we get to the bottom bottom of it and speaking of getting to the bottom of it you know that metaphor has come to me like I'll have a vision of like a junkyard of cars you know at the bottom of a lake where it's like muck and and just the bottom of the lake bed like the lake has been drained and there's all these dead cars on the bottom you know yeah. to me that's like shells of past lives because a vehicle is a body like a you know and uh and I thought, oh, great, I'm getting to the bottom of at least a whole group of them like that, you know, like over a, uh, a category, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many ways all this unfolds, but I was so grateful to see that because I knew then that I was getting, get, cleaning something out. And when I, when I finished like a, a certain area, I'm usually doing something like sweeping the floor. I see myself vacuuming, sweeping the floor, you know, doing things like that. And then I know, and then, and like the room is clean, whereas it previously was cluttered, for example, you know? So I also have signs that I'm done with some, a certain part when I see the, the cleanup, because that's what it is, it's cleanup work. Yeah. And when, when I see, I literally see a room being I'm cleaning out the a room. Remember, my father's house has many mansions, like that. So there's, it's just one of many. But still, okay, great. Another one is cleaned out. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, so can we move on now? And I'd love to hear about your journey in this lifetime, like um, your personal journey on Earth and the spiritual journey that's brought you to now. So. Share away, please, Sandy. Tell us about you. Well, I, uh, I'm from the Midwest in the United States, in, in Wisconsin, um, Salt Lake, Michigan, and near Chicago, just north of Chicago. And I lived there through high school, and I went to college uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. And I stayed in Wisconsin until I was 32, just with various jobs. My profession was engineering. Um, and I would say I was aware of spirituality, but I had a completely intellectual approach to it. Like I would read book after book after book. Or in that in that time, I had some jobs that were kind of far away, and I had a long commute, like an hour and a half one way. And I had all kinds of, this was cassette tape days, I had all kinds of self-help, books on tapes, everything. And I was taking all this in. But I don't, it wasn't, it was all intellectual, it seemed intellectual to me now. Like um, feeding a habit of wanting information, but not like real wisdom. Um, so I, the autobiography of a yogi, you know, uh, I found the Saint Germain, the Green Books from the I Am Movement, and um, Masters of the Far East by Baird T. Spaulding, all these stories, and I would read like Swami Rama and all these tales of the Masters in the Himalayas, and I felt a real connection to all that, uh, but I don't think it was applying it. My life was pretty material and pretty job oriented, and I was in the work phase, I would say, of 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 my life. And um, 
But I will go back to when I was 12. I had a very definite vision of Jesus, uh, experiential dream, experienced vision of Jesus. Large, just very large being. Um, and we were both at the end of a pier that went out into the lake, like there's a breakwater or something like that. And a very large, like, tsunami wave was coming. And, um, and there was a beast, like, I don't know, the most horrible beast you can imagine, whatever that would be, right there at the end of the pier waiting to, yeah, get me, basically. But Jesus was there. And, um, and I had a sense that things, you know, maybe things, it's like karma. It's a wave of, you know, your karma starts to descend when, after you're 12 years old. That's according to the spiritual law. And, but I didn't really know that then. I just knew, oh, my God, and it, this was a really terrible thing. It seemed like a feel of fear and everything and foreboding, but nevertheless, Jesus was there. So and I never really forgot that, but it was many years later before I really saw Jesus again, um, and that was in 2008. So I was 48, so from 12 to 48. It was in this very interested in spiritual topics and subjects, but only really from a materialistic point of view, an intellectual knowledge perspective, and not necessarily working on myself, really using it, putting it into practice, not walking the talk. Anyway, well, I think it's similar to something like Mother Mary, who had said in her, her embodiment as Mary, um, that when Archangel Gabriel came to her, the vision, and said, you know, you could, now now it's time for this in your life, and so on and so forth. And um, in the same way, Jesus came to me and reminded me, really reminded me, woke, really woke me up. Jesus was right in my face, like, like, <laughs> You know, I, literally eye to eye, nose to nose, mouth to mouth. And I couldn't, I couldn't, there's no way I could ignore it. Like Paul on the road to Damascus. Jesus had a right to present Paul with the option to <laughs> wake up, wait, remember, you know, wait, remember, we were going to work together. And uh, so I had my come to Jesus moment again later in life. And I'll tell you, your life changes when you really, really have the experience. It, your life will never be the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I was very, at first I was scared. I was, I was afraid. So I had all my sins flashed before my eyes. Oh no, what does Jesus want with me? I've done all these bad things. And not anymore. I don't feel that way, of course. But <laughs> in the moment, this Jesus' light stirred up things that I had to let go of. That I would, okay, my lifestyle and this and that and, in order to follow Christ, it does to change. I mean, mm -hmm. realistically, it does. So Jesus, uh, Jesus woke me up, came and woke me up, and reminded me, "It's now, but now, wait, and really gonna follow me, right?" <laughs> and um, he spoke to me. He said, um, he "Said Sandy, can you hear me?" And I said, "I said yes, Lord." And um, and he said, "Follow me." Exactly that. And so when you're called literally by your name. <laughs> <laughs> that's the turning point in your life uh, and I'm great, so grateful to Jesus for presenting me with that opportunity to make the choice to follow him and so since 2008 and 2009 and 10 was also very big years for uh, visions and, and encounters and experiences and so on and, and, and now of course we're I would say you know we're anchored and uh, I pray that there's um, nothing to knock me off the horse, so to speak. Um, yeah. yeah. So basically, the uh, Jesus came and woke me up, and I thought there was some. I, I was afraid to follow Christ at first because my first thought was, "Oh no, I'm going to be crucified again." <laughs> that was my first thought. Oh no. <laughs> Not again. So, but then I said, like, oh, well, all right, so what? 
but Cordy been through it. Like it once one more time. So I thought I thought that following Christ in this life would mean literally mean that again in the beginning of the that. But but now I'm kind of more aware of that. I won't be. I, I, well, Jesus said you will be in, but in your mental body or in your emotional body, not 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 in your physical body. And indeed, I have I have already experienced being murdered and dying many times. And yeah. now I just say, I wake up in the morning and I say, well, I guess what? I'm still here. I'm still here. You know, no matter how many times I really was crucified, murdered or tortured, hung, whatever, played, all the things that from the Inquisition, I used to go to art museums and see those horrible pictures that they actually put in art museums of, of, of medieval art. And I would cry because it, I knew that it happened to me, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't take it personally anymore. But now I just say, well, I'm still here, no matter what happens, clubbed to death. I mean, all kind of things, you know, your skull splatters open. You know, it's, it's all been a bit of a shock this lifetime because the experience of all of that trauma from all the past lifetimes, like that's all there or has been there. And But... Um, the reality is, is that most of us, not everybody, but a lot of us in this lifetime, like you and I, it's been pretty easy, really. Like, it's um, it's actually, to me, I just think, wow, I must have just chosen, I'm sure I just chose to come in and have a nice, easy finish off life and let's, like, work on everything without, yeah, worrying about being crucified again. Um, mm. Well, um, yes. So, so now I know that uh, I am working. I, I in in our next to last or last embodiment, which I believe that's where I'm at. The master say that everything has to come out, and you will re-experience everything and continue to um, move beyond all of that. So, I think for me, it's not an easy life. <laughs> I, I'm having a very intense life. But it's not happening to me physically. That's all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's what I mean. Like, you know, this that threat of um yeah, of death or torture, it, it's not here for it's not here for me in this lifetime. But all the all the trauma and all the psychology that went came with that, that was a reaction to that, like that's what I've had to deal with. So yeah, it has been traumatic in that way, like dealing with the trauma. Um, mm. So when did you, when did you find um, the teachings that have been coming through Kim, like when and, and how has your path sort of gone since then? Well, it was pretty much simultaneous with Jesus appearing to me in that 2007 and eight time frame. It was, it was like also, and now I want you to find you know, the, our living revelations and so on. And that's that's when I found it because Jesus directed me to find it. So I found it. And that's what the Master say that in general, persons are directed to find the group that they're meant to be in. So I would say Jesus directed me to find it. And it was in that same time frame of uh, waking up, which to me was crucial because when I look back, we had a four-year vigil. Remember, 2012 was a, was literally a spiritual cycle. In addition to it being whatever it was, you know, in the outer a millennium and all that, or 2012, it really was the end of a, a spiritual cycle. Uh, but but before that, the last four years was a spiritual vigil, and I needed to participate, or I had a part of my divine plan was to wake up and participate in this vigil that was starting four years before the end of the cycle. So I, I literally feel like I just got in under the wire. Yeah. Hey, I just want to say thank you because I didn't, I didn't get, I, I was still in, in a lot of trauma at that point. And I always, I always look back because, you know, I, I felt like I, I was saved, um, you know, around 2012 where it all came to an end. But I just always had this sense that someone was helping me. Like, like I just, and I didn't, I, I knew, you know, I was in it, but I just knew. And now I understand that 
people like you were holding a vigil. So thank you. It saved my life, really. Well, I have my, my, my life saved so many times that I really just gratitude mm. almost just causes me to just levitate just because I, I mean it so dearly how many times I've been saved, <laughs> you know, really. And, um, yeah, there, well, we have, we have certain points in our divine plan, our timelines or targets that the master just said mentioned that you don't want to miss. And when it's a really important one, they have sort of some authority to intercede, you know, such if you have a momentum with a certain master, you know, they can, they can give you help, give you a lot of help. And, uh, so without that, wow. So I can look back and definitively see that there was definitely a, a time frame to, to be getting on board. Mm, mm. Hey, and so I know that you've been, um, a part of your work has taken you a, around the world to all sorts of different places. Could you share a little bit about that and, you know, what it's been like for you personally and your spiritual experiences with that um, in different places? Well, now with my spiritual perspective, I look all back on my career and the international work I did with a different lens, meaning I had karma to resolve. And the job was the means by which I was taken to all the places where I needed to clear up, you know, the energy and re-encounter re things and re-encounter people and re-encounter places. And so I can clearly see it now that I've, now that it's finished. I wasn't so obvious, wasn't so obvious when I was, when I was in it, but I call it the diplomatic tour <laughs> um, because I was, I felt, I look back now and I was, it was clearly guided to change from this job to that job or this project to that project. And I know that I was literally moved around all around the world, all seven continents really to clean it up, to clean up my footprints you know, in the sand, as they say, you're the energy that was misqualified because that's what, you know, sand or rubble kind of represents uh, low states of energy, no state of nothing. And, and I even had a, saw myself at one point pushing a, it was a cart, like a, it had a handle like this and then a, a platform and it had, it literally had a concrete block on it a big heavy concrete block. I was pushing it in the desert. I mean, it was like tumbleweeds and thorns and <laughs> all this stuff. And I was pushing this thing out in the, you know, out in left field, basically out in the wilderness. And I was off the beaten, off the path, you know? So I had to, you know, whatever securitous detours that we took in our lives. And I, I personally took many, um, I had to, wind back around and go to go to the mall go so back did, to the mall did you have any any specific sort of can you correlate any past lives with particular places at all like have you seen anything well i think it all correlates especially russia to be honest um i lived in russia and i worked on some projects especially in russia and i did have dreams about peter the great about the time of peter the great and uh, that I, I felt that I was there at that time of building St. Petersburg and um, kind of part of reorienting Russia towards Europe. That was the point of moving the capital and artisans from Europe uh, came to St. Petersburg to, to help build it in international style, a European style and so on and so forth. And I had, I had dreams with Peter the Great that I, you know, was a, one of the workers or an advisor or a, a, a personal known person to Peter, to Peter the Great. And even in, and Peter the Great spent six months incognito work learning shipbuilding in the Netherlands outside of Amsterdam. And I, I became aware of this and I was actually in the Netherlands in Amsterdam and I, I went to the house. It's actually a historical place. 
and I went to this little cabin where Peter the Great um, lived while he was learning shipbuilding to go physically back to Russia and teach his people how to build ships. He was really a hands-on um, type of person. And the energy, you know, you, you, you know, there is something there, <laughs> you know, where, where a person, where a person's life unfolded or something like that. And so, yes, I, I, I had concrete experiences of, of past lives and people I knew and places where we were and things that have happened. Uh, that's just one of them. Mm. So what about, I know you've been to an Antarctica, like just why Antarctica? Why, why were you taken there? Well, I've always loved to travel and I've had a adventurous mind and, and, uh, I became aware of jobs available in Antarctica at some point. And I thought, oh, well, I'll apply. But see, again, is it me that's directing all these things or am I following, you know, the crumbs already that were already put down and, you know, like a like the turtle that goes back to the exact beach where it was born. You, you, you're just you you can't not. Miss, you can hardly miss it, you know. So that was the next thing. I needed to go to Antarctica. And uh, I went many times over like a 12-year period. So that was a fairly long and fairly significant aspect of my, of my career and my travels. And um, I think for me, it had a lot to do with overcoming the spiritual poison called non-will, non-being, which is represented by ice, frozen, you're paralyzed. You're, you know, you're, as opposed to lava or a volcano, which is unconstructed flow, which is, you know, like that. And ice is your fear. You're paralyzed with fear and you're not moving, you know, and all that. So I think I had a lot more of the cold aspect of non-feeling non-loving um i had a lot of ice to clear metaphorically out of out of my container of self and um i even had an experience where i was like juxtaposed right inside of the ice and I was literally inside the ice, and I was looking around inside the ice, and I was like, oh, this is like Swiss cheese, you know? Yeah. I mean, there was underneath the surface, which looks makes it look like it's really kind of solid. It wasn't. It was all, it was all like cavernous underneath there and underneath there and in there. And uh, so I had experience of, of myself, um, like my bed was on an iceberg, you know, um, Meaning like, like if you make, like that, that's where I fell asleep. If I see things like beds and sleeping, it means sleeping. You know, you're not awake. You're, you're really like your eyes are closed. This is a blinded period of my, from my past that had to do with all this ice and eyes closed and being asleep. And so uh, that helped me to, going to Antarctica helped me to, <clears throat> recognize just how much non-will and non-being there was from perhaps several million years of being in embodiment. Yeah, yeah. And um, all that accumulates. I mean, it's literally, you know, all that, it felt like that's accumulated in, in me as well. Yeah. And so I know that a part of, I guess, you know, we go through this process of seeing seeing where the trauma is and and letting it go and dealing with it. But then also, it's like we sort of replace it with um, a forward move and energy. And I know that you um, you've gone into study art and you've produced all of these amazing artworks of and you know that were from based around Antarctica. So could you share a bit about you know what you've been doing with your creative? path and you know what ideas you have in your manifestation bubble well I I wanted to I always dreamed of being a painter wanting to be a painter I've always gone to art museums I'm very well self-studied in terms of art history and artists and paintings and fairly knowledgeable and uh 
But I, I never imagined myself, well, I imagined myself painting, but I, it was one of these things where I had a block to actually starting or doing any, doing it, actually physically doing it. And so finally, I finally, I broke through that. And um, cause I thought, oh, it's too late now. All these excuses and even lies uh, about my potential was I missed that I didn't do it when I was younger. Now I don't know how to do it anyway, or I can't get into school because I have no portfolio and all kinds of things. And it all turned out to not be true. <laughs> and um, anyhow, so I did feel like I was time to paint a life memoir. I wanted to have a life memoir or leave a record on earth, but I uh, didn't have the, I needed to develop the skills to produce an illustrated memoir, you know, like you look at a nice book and that's illustrated, it's a nicer book, you know, it's more interesting. And so I wanted to self-illustrate, so I did go back to art school and I wanted to make a, um, a memoir of all seven continents and so uh, Antarctica just came, came first in the series because I did spend a lot of time there and it's interesting. And for as far as launching my art career, uh, if I say I have a portfolio of Antarctic landscapes, people, it's just a curiosity. People are more interested in than say, if I said I had landscapes of California, well, there always, there's millions of those, right? Not to knock anyone who does that, but I, it was a way to enter the art world with something unique and something different and, um, I can always, it's easy to talk about. So, so I decided to start with Antarctica. And, uh, so, and right when I, when I graduated with my master's in fine art, I didn't ask him or anything. He just started to ask me for, if I had any paintings that could be for the book, book covers. And so, you know, the last several years, that's how my paintings have ended up on the covers of the books. But I am going to be making new content now since I'm coming on from Antarctica. Is it that, is it the anti, is it the one about elitism or something like this, an, an Antarctica picture painting of yours? Like, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's one painting that's split into three books. So if you look at the cover of three books, you see the whole painting. Ah, it's called a, right. a triptych. Trip means three. It's a, it's a painting divided like an altarpiece is like three pieces. You know, it's kind of like that. I took one painting and split it into three. And there's so there's part A, B, and C for those three books. Um, elitism, Which, dictatorships, and fanaticism. Yep, yep. Um, and the women's liberation, is that you too? Uh, yeah, but now that was more of an inspiration from my mind. Um, it's called Forerunners because we're Mother Mary's Forerunners. And so it's the picture of, I used to run in marathon races. I wasn't a real runner. I just did it for fitness. You know, I was never a competitive or anything. It's kind of slow, but anyway, I, I just had this vision of, you know, thousands of runners right uh and but we all have a, we're all blue the bodies are all blue just to signify the will of god and uh, um and everyone has holding up a flashlight you know a torch and running in perspective towards a, the tunnel with the, with the golden light um so mo that's mother mary's forerunners Ah, right. Well, yeah. For the spiritual liberation of women movement that is now all in our fourth year. Again. Yeah, I'll have a look at that again now that you've given the description of it, like, you know, what, yeah, what, what it's all symbolizing, because, yeah, it's good to know these things. Hey, so. Our time is um, pretty much come to come to an end. So um, I'd like to thank you, Sandy, and for so much. And it's been really lovely just listening to you and getting to know you and about your journey and your perspectives. And um, thank you for being here. Namaste. My <laughs> pleasure. Beautiful. Thank you for 
being the spiritual leader of the spiritual fellowship. Yeah, <laughs> it's providing a platform, like yeah, for people to to jump on and share themselves. So um, thank you for sharing yourself. All right. Um, so goodbye, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Until next time. Bye-bye.